but in the light or darkness of the recent presidential election, perhaps my talk has, as was indicated, a, a particularly painful timeliness. I would say we meet here as survivors, one may say historical survivors, of, the, of this election. I'll discuss later in my remarks the importance of survivor, the importance for survivors of meaning and mission. But let me say here that Eric Erickson, the gifted psychoanalyst, spoke some time ago of the necessity of his adult patients to hit what he called rock bottom before they could show signs of health and recovery. We may be in the process of hitting a kind of rock bottom as a nation and the dangerous directions our leaders are taking us in, and in a sense, rock bottom in ourselves in many cases, in our passionate opposition to these policies. Like Erickson's patients, we must first allow ourselves to experience that pain and foreboding. We can't avoid it, we have to take it in, uh, and then emerge from that state to reassert our efforts at personal and national health. To do that, we need to confront our historical and psychological actuality as well as we can. In my own case, uh, it's been my fate to look at many of the horrors of the last half of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st. I confess to a, a commitment to confront these collective horrors, uh, but I do so in a spirit of hope, seeking small currents of understanding that may help us to take more humane directions. The principle is a very simple one. It's that of looking into the abyss in order to see beyond it. If you don't look into the abyss, uh, you're not seeing where we are. And if you stay stuck in the abyss, you're immobilized and can't do very much about it. The immediate abyss for us now is the war in Iraq and also the mindset of those who created that war. And we need to confront those uh, if we're to take stock of where we are. Very simple point to start with, uh, which is probably clear to you already. The war in Iraq is a war of choice. We didn't have to go to war. It was uh, a war that those who created it, uh, in the case of those who created it, who felt motivated to initiate it, uh, it was described as a preemptive war. It hasn't even been that. A preemptive war can be said to exist when the alleged enemy has initiated or is initiating or is about to initiate an attack on you. There was no such situation in Iraq. Uh, it was a preventive war. Uh, and preventive war with the idea that somehow in some way this country, this regime will be is dangerous to one's own future. A preventive war policy becomes particularly grotesque in the nuclear age. Some of you in this audience may be old enough to remember the cries for preventive war when the Soviet Union began to develop nuclear weapons. The thought was, well, we better annihilate them now before they use these weapons on us. Had we listened to these voices for a preventive war, tens of millions of people would have been incinerated. Fortunately, uh, other views prevailed. I'll be talking tonight about what I call a worldwide epidemic of apocalyptic violence aimed at vast destruction in the service of some kind of purification and renewal. Uh, I'll say more about that in a while. But I want to just say a little bit about my approach over the years uh, to these kinds of issues. And it's been broadly speaking psychohistorical, that really means no more than applying psychological methods to historical questions. And in that work, I've been much influenced by Eric Erickson, uh, who developed a model or paradigm of the great man or the great person in history. And his two subjects of psychobiography uh, were Gandhi and Luther, and his model was that of the great man or great person struggling with inner conflicts which can be solved not only for himself, but for a whole collectivity of his time and era. And that's what he did in the case of uh, Gandhi and Luther. My own model, uh, though much influenced by Erickson, 
moves in a somewhat different direction, what I call shared themes. It means looking at people and as much as possible interviewing them. Uh, people who have been, groups of people who have been powerfully affected by historical events, who have had their impact on historical events, and it's often both true of the same group, and looking to see what they have in common psychologically and historically, and then generalizing out from that in terms of that larger era. To do that has meant straying from the classical psychoanalytic model of instinct and defense and making use of a model of life continuity or of death and the continuity of life. And I would say that one needs this broader model for any larger historical study, all the more so when the studies uh, are involved with large-scale destructiveness. The other dimension of this model is combining the psychological nitty-gritty that we're used to focusing on, that is, life stories of individual people, their struggles for some kind of success, for pleasure, for some sort of uh, approval in their lives, and combining that with what I call an ultimate dimension of larger human connectedness, or the symbolization of immortality, that is, living on, a struggle to live on in one's children and their children, or uh, biological or biosocial way, in some religious principle of eternal life, uh, in some social or creative mode in which, uh, through one's teaching or one's writings or creations in some way, or through eternal nature, which is so symbolized by uh, all cultures. The power of eternal nature was brought home to me when Hiroshima survivors quoted to me uh, an old Chinese proverb uh, in which they said, um, the state may collapse, but the mountains and rivers remain. And then there's a, a fifth mode of larger connectedness or symbolic immortality, that of experiential transcendence or high states, states so intense that uh, within them, time and death disappear. And all of these are important to look at in connection with groups that one studies uh, if one is addressing these larger historical events and particularly destructive historical events. In that sense, history is not something out there, but it's inside of all of us in important ways. Uh, and the post-9-11 history that I'll be talking about uh, is very much, uh, uh, that's very much the case. Uh, my own journey through these events in the 20th and 21st centuries has to do with efforts at what could be called professional witness to these events. But I want to say that when we look at 9-11 and post-9-11 behavior today, it's a little different from what I've studied. Different in the sense that it's still very much with us. We are in it. Uh, we're in it because 9-11 is so recent and all the more so because our leaders have systematically manipulated it in terms of manipulating fear and uh, taking advantage of various responses to 9-11 for their own political and military purposes. In any case, we're still very much immersed in it now. In terms of some of the studies that I've done, and I'm only mentioning these as they have bearing on our present situation, let me mention four of them. Way back in the mid-50s, in the mid -50s, my earliest study uh, was that of Chinese communist thought reform, a so-called brainwashing. And uh, I was focusing at that time on the phenomenon of ideological totalism, all or none immersion in a movement and ideas. And everything I've done since then uh, has some connection to that issue of ideological totalism. But I came to realize subsequently that this psychological or mental process had its own apocalyptic dimensions. It really was an effort to remove and destroy all pre-revolutionary thought in order to replace it with the ultimate revolutionary truth. Uh, 